Then Jesus, uh, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee. And a report about him spread throughout all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed or given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. So let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing, the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. At uh, this time, we, we would invite, I invite the children to come forward for the children's message. If you want to come forward and join me up front here. Good morning. I greet each of you. Say good morning. You can run. That's right. Run. That's awesome. Good morning, everybody. How are you all this morning? Good. Good. Well, I'm excited to share with you before you head off to hear your Sunday school lesson and, and have fun time in Sunday school today. We're talking about the city where Jesus grew up. Now, how many of you remember where Jesus was born? Just a little, a couple months ago, we heard where? Where? Bethlehem. But how many of you know where he grew up? What town is he from? Where did he grow up? Yeah, do you remember? Starts with Minnesota. Not quite. Um, but it starts with, um, starts with this. Ready? Say it with me. Nazareth. Nazareth. Yeah, and so in today's story we hear how Jesus um, is out in the countryside, kind of like out in the country, and then all of a sudden he decides he's going to go back home. He's going to go to his hometown of Nazareth, and he decides that he's going to go to his church and see his friends and maybe some family members, and then he's going to worship with them, and he is handed a scroll from the Bible. And he reads this scroll, and it talks about the Holy Spirit. Can you say Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit. Now, you're going to probably learn about what it means for Jesus to go home. But today, I want to share with you and be sure you understand what the Holy Spirit is. We're going to do one thing first. Sometimes we hear about God, about how God is Father. Can you say Father? Father. And we hear God is Son. Can you say Jesus? And then we hear about God as Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit is something that is a part of God that does a very particular thing. And that thing, and it's a big word, I'm going to teach it to you. Sanctify. sanctify. Say that one more time. Sanctify. sanctify. And I'll give you a hint. Does anyone know what it means? It means to make you holy. So we say, Holy God, Holy Spirit. The Spirit sanctifies us. It makes each one of us holy. It touches us in a way that we become children of God. So remember that today when you're learning about Jesus' hometown. Would you join me today in prayer? Would you put your hands together like this and pray with me? Dear God, sanctify us. Make us holy. Help us be your people. And hear your promises in your word, in your name. Amen. Amen. That's awesome. You guys are welcome to go with Laura and have a, a wonderful experience today in your Sunday school time. Thank you for coming up and sharing with me. <clears throat> I, I just as an aside, like th I'm not preaching right now, by the way. I'm just telling you a story. It is so wonderful when you're at their level and their eyes just kind of do this. They're just go, they're so big and they're so, it's very, there's a word for that. It's just authentic. Truly what it is. It's really wonderful. We begin with a word of prayer. 
Holy God, um, just come down and be present here in your spirit in our lives. Um, right now, in the form of a word and song, in the form of just your, your, your presence that is just so powerful and so amazing. I pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so this week, um, we begin our text, and it's a really great gospel lesson. Excuse me. It's a story that's very interesting. And, and as I read this story, <clears throat> just to k- kind of give you an, a, a synopsis of what it is, Luke is telling us a couple of things. The first thing that Luke is sharing is that this is the beginning. It's the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And so <clears throat> this is like the story where Jesus gets the first opportunity to be heard in public. And it's not necessarily a sermon, but it's the time that Jesus gets to share a message, a very important message, and we'll get to that. And so um, this last week, when I, when I read uh, through this gospel lesson, I thought, hmm, when was the first time that I, that I gave my, my first sermon? And I had to think back just a little bit. And I remember it. I remember it well. I was, a, I believe I was a first year student in seminary and graduate school. And I remember sitting one night, I was in my dorm and I was, I was studying like all seminary students do every hour of the day. It's fun. And I heard the phone ring. And in those days, the phone was on the wall and there was this cord connected to it. How many of you remember that? Yeah. And you had to get up. You couldn't just pull it out of your pocket because if it was in my pocket, it wouldn't ring. You know what I mean? So I had to get up and I walked across to the, to the and I picked up the phone with the cord and I said, hi, this is Reg. And it was my pastor from my hometown, um, Pastor Sandy. And she was so excited to share with me that my congregation from this really, really small farming community in southern Minnesota, West Concord, Minnesota, Trinity Lutheran Church, had decided they were going to give me a scholarship. And from my seminary training that they had, you know, a son of their congregation was going off the seminary and they were so proud. And I was just elated. I, I really didn't have the words. All I could do was just say, you know, thank you, thank you. I don't know. And I, I could just kept repeating, thank you, thank you. And then, uh, then came the hook. Because then she's like, well, we're excited. We want you to come home. And then um, we want you to present it to you in worship. And we want you to preach for us. And I thought, yay! You know, I was like, because I was scared. I'll be honest. I was like, what? You know, I was excited at the same time, though, because I never really preached. And I was just going to school, first year of seminary. I was just learning about what that meant. To, to, you know, put together a sermon. And, and uh, so I accepted. I said, absolutely, I'll do that. And so we set the date. And I had a couple weeks. And I thought about the text for some time. And I thought, what am I going to do? I just want to, I really want to woo them. You know, I want to wow them and, and just kind of earn their trust and win their hearts and thank them for believing in me in this scholarship. And so I thought, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to tell them about all these wonderful things that I'm learning. All these big theological words and all these concepts. And, and then I wrote my sermon and I got done with it. I was practicing it and I realized it was boring. <laughs> it was very boring. I mean, I didn't want to hear about these words and these things that didn't really matter to my faith right then. And I realized something about myself in terms of my preaching that that. It, my style was more about the story, worrying about um, telling a part of the story in terms of the gospel lesson. And the theme for that day um, really struck a note with me. The theme for worship that day was about how we hide our sin from God. And not just hide our sin, but we bury it. And we hide ourselves from God. And to go a little further, I wanted to talk that day about this thing called confession and this thing called absolution and forgiveness. So what I did was I shared a story, my own story. I shared a story about the first time that I ever stole something and the last time I ever stole because it was the same moment. I was five years old and, and I think I've shared this story, so I'll just share a little bit of it. I was five years old and I stole a matchbox car, like big deal. But it was a big deal. And that, it's what I did with it. I took that car. I felt so guilty. Then I went in my backyard 
And I dug a hole, and I buried it. And I never told anyone, ever. And that day, I'm, I'm preaching this sermon for the very first time, and my mom, who sits in the front row, is unlike any Lutheran, you know, would do that, um, sitting in the front row, and she's hearing this for the first time. I grew up in a single-parent home. My mom raised me, and, and I'm confessing about how we bury our sins and we hide them away from our Lord in hopes that we might not have to face that, in hopes that we don't have to confront that. But there was something that happened in the story, in the confession for me that day. Finally, when I, at the end of the day, the thing I remember most about my first sermon and sharing my first sermon was how intently people looked and received the story. They heard God's word being uh, projected to them into their lives and into their hearts. And that that truly meant something for me that day. Today we hear how Jesus is beginning a ministry. And Luke wants us to tell us so many different things and very important right at the beginning of this story. He says that Jesus is out in the countryside. It's a very important detail. He's out amongst the, the communities of Galilee, and he's preaching, and he's teaching in their synagogues. Now, something is different about Jesus today. Different than, than what we would normally expect. At least, not us, the reader, but the people back home. It says that Jesus has come home to Nazareth. Home is where he had friends. He grew up with people. He learned a trade. Uh, He became the son of a a carpenter. And for many different years, that's what he practiced. And you got to remember, these are the kids he went to school with. And and now they have families. and, And now they have businesses. And all of a sudden, Jesus is back home. And he's been out there. And something is different about him. And what's different is, number one, he's no longer a carpenter. He's a rabbi. From the time he was 15 until the time he was 30, he was a carpenter. Now he's beginning his ministry and he's changed from a peasant into a rabbi. That's a huge transformation. Uh, It's one where he would have been just working in a shop, building a chair or a table or something constructive, to moving along and sharing God's word. Lifting up God's law amongst the people. Uh, The rabbi was seen as a person of the utmost honor and revered amongst all people of faith in that community. And and this different person has challenged the way things are happening. If you can imagine Jesus coming home to his home congregation, I suppose it would be kind of like this. If, If someone from Carver or Chaska or Shakopee went on American Idol, and you watched it, and you saw them every week get, get all the way to the top, and they were the final two, and they won. And imagine they would come home, and there would be such stardom, they would come home to have a, a show for the community, to kind of give thanks. That's what it would have been like for Jesus to come home to Nazareth. So he comes to his congregation. There's all this excitement. And Luke lets us know very well something else is different. Luke lets us know in the very beginning that Jesus is different in such a way that he's filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. That the power of God rests upon him. This is a huge deal. That something has changed within Jesus. He's no longer this carpenter, but rather he's a rabbi. And more than that, he has transformed that the power of the Holy Spirit is now in him. I've always thought about what what that might mean um, in terms of like physical appearance of Jesus. You know, Jesus goes into the synagogue and people are excited, anticipating what he's going to say to them. What's the message he has for them? And all of a sudden he stands up and he, he gets this, this scroll and it would have been not like a Bible or a book. It would have been this big roll of paper on one end and another end. In the middle they would have rolled it together and he would have found the spot and he stands up. And he reads from the prophet Isaiah. A reading that, that, that they would have heard many times before like we may have heard before. And Jesus says these words. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. 
Do you hear it? Did you hear it again? Luke's letting us know that the Spirit of God is now present in this one. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has set me to proclaim the release of the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then something just clearly happens, very quietly. The anticipation just kind of lets out of the room. That this Jesus and his, and his appearance, and I've always wondered that. If Jesus is filled by the Holy Spirit, what did that look like? I mean, standing there. What did, what did he look like being full of the Spirit? I, I know that we hear it sometimes in biblical terms, or maybe even modern terms. In songs we say, Holy Spirit, come and be present here. Be present in our hearts. I think that um, over time in history... Artists have rendered this in, in many different ways, especially pictures of Jesus. This, this picture, you see a little bit of it. What's he wearing? Um, what color is his, his vestments? They're white. Yeah, a lot of times in paintings and murals, especially old, old churches, you'll see murals of Jesus. He's wearing white, dazzling white robes. Once in a while, you'll see something else different about Jesus. He's something around his head, and it's maybe in a form of a what? Anyone know? A halo, I think I heard it. Sometimes we'll see Jesus with this bright light like casting down on his head to let us know that there's something different about this one. He's divine. He shows a presence about him. But in actuality, if you were in Jesus' home congregation, you were sitting there in his hometown that day, what would have been different physically? I... My guess is that, that he wouldn't have been glowing. He didn't have a halo. He was Jesus, the rabbi, the son of God. But I would imagine that there was something about him, and I, would, I imagine it in such a way that when he's being filled by the Holy Spirit, he stands with confidence. That he's filled with a, a sort of ability just to stand proud and firm and knowing who he is, and what is inside of him. You might know people like this in your life that, you know, they're very confident when they stand before you. And other times you might know people who their shoulders are sagging or their face is sagging or their hearts are sagging and there's not that confidence there. There's something else going on. There's something that they need to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And I think that we all go through hard times in our lives, difficult times. It might be a bad day. It might be a bad week, a month, or maybe a bad year for you. And I think it's okay. I think it's okay to call on the name of the Lord. I think that we forget in our walk of faith that sometimes it's okay to say, Lord, I really need you right here, right now. To be present to come down and be in me now I can't do this on my own I'm gonna give over whatever it is I'm trying to do because I'm not able to Lord I need you now I think it's a powerful present invitation for us for us to invoke the power of God I think Luke is letting us know that Jesus has this power and that it's right there in front of us. Right there for us to call into our lives when we need it most. The people there that they have a, maybe a very different opinion about what they expected to hear from Jesus. It's one that kind of like doesn't hit home for them maybe. They were maybe hoping to hear how Jesus was going to be a powerful leader, be a, a political leader and stand on a platform and raise himself up politically, or maybe he was going to be a champion for the Holy of Holies, those who sat high in the synagogues on their thrones, or maybe he was going to bring power to himself. But instead of all these, maybe, positions, 
they hear something entirely different. Jesus is going to be a champion of the peasant. Jesus is going to be a champion of the poor. Jesus is going to champion those who don't see their own sin and help them see their sin. Jesus is going to be a champion for those who are oppressed, for those who are struggling to let go and let God come in and be present, be filled by the Holy Spirit. I think that Luke is telling us something today in this very first setting where Jesus gets to share his message. Luke is telling us that Jesus sees the world much more different than you and I do. Jesus sees the world in a way that we just don't every day. Jesus sees our own sin and knows that we struggle with it. Jesus sees who you are and knows that you can't let go of all those things. Jesus knows that you and I are oppressed and need to be released of these things. I think Luke is challenging us to give God an invitation this day. For God to come down and be present in His Holy Spirit. Lord God, come down in your spirit and be present in our lives. Amen. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, come once again and, and sanctify us as your people. Transform our hearts. Make us holy before you. In Christ's name, amen.